The best thing about being a member of CIR is being part of a community of ADR practitioners where one gains access to professional development opportunities through seminars, workshops, and accreditation courses, as well as access to networking opportunities through conferences and social events. We offer a range of courses which equip people with the knowledge and skills that they need to both, well, to avoid, manage and resolve a dispute. Because we believe these are fundamentally important skills for people to learn. The courses that I've taken through the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators have all been uh, led by very senior practitioners. So also as a senior practitioner, it gives me an awful lot of opportunity to learn more, much more than sitting in a classroom and listening to someone speak. Well, I'd recommend um, the CIR training because it's very thorough. Uh, it's recognized as a gold standard, and so having the qualifications will help you in your career. First of all, one of the benefits of being an associate at Charter Institute of Arbitrators is an opportunity to visit events and conferences on, on, on highly interesting topics. Uh, you are not only engaged in discussions, but also you receive plenty of networking opportunities. Not only was I able to attend events with leading practitioners and scholars in the field of international arbitration, but also CR allowed me to meet other students from all over the world with similar interests and thus develop further networking and professional skills. Welcome to everyone joining us around the world for the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Mediation 2020 and Beyond webinar. My name is Catherine Dixon and I'm the Institute's Director General. I take this opportunity to warmly welcome Jane Gurn, our speaker today, and the Institute's Director of Training and Development, Paresh Kafrani. I'm proud to lead the Institute as a mediator and lawyer because I believe mediation provides an effective way of resolving conflict and disputes. This supports access to justice and provides business certainty, which is greatly needed during this time of change and economic uncertainty. The Institute is committed to mediation. We'll be launching virtual mediation training this summer and holding a mediation symposium on mediation as a multidisciplinary practice in December 2020. Jane will tell you more about this in her talk. I'm also proud to have launched the Pandemic Business Disputes Resolution Service last week. The service was created by the Institute and CEDA to enable businesses to, do, to resolve disputes arising from the pandemic using effective dispute resolution at a fixed cost online and quickly. It offers businesses three options, facilitated contract renegotiation, mediation or fast track arbitration. We are committed to support business during this difficult time, enabling them to get back to work. I'm delighted to introduce Jane Gurn, our speaker today. Jane is a former lawyer with a mission to help busy executives to collaborate effectively and experience the magic of conflict as they manage change, challenge and crisis in their organisations. Jane is a highly sought after mediator, facilitator and speaker. Jane specialises in collaboration, cross-cultural communication and transforming business relationships. Jane is the Chair of the Board of Management of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and is the former Director and Board Member of the Civil Mediation Council of England and Wales. Jane is also past President of the Professional Speaking Association of UK and Ireland and Jane has been invited to speak at the United Nations, the White House, the European Commission and at the Internal Energy Agency and has spoken at conferences and events all over the world. Jane has also worked with organisations large and small, including Cable and Wireless, the NHS, BAA, Bacardi Martini, McLaren Racing, the Royal Institution of Chartered uh, Surveyors, and many more. 
Jane is also the author of two popular books on conflict management, How to Beat Bedlam in the Boardroom and Boredom in the Bedroom, and The Authority Guide to Conflict Resolution. Jane's skill is getting people talking together about what matters most, and her approach is also always interactive and fun. So no pressure, Jane, and over to you, Jane. Catherine, thank you so much. And hello, hello to everybody. Um, I'm just delighted that we've got so many people on this webinar from literally all over the world. So I'm saying hello to friends and to colleagues and to people I haven't yet met. And I know you're all sitting in your own homes because of the times we're in. So I want to say, I hope you're sitting comfortably. Are you sitting comfortably? Well, you shouldn't be. And you shouldn't be because we're living in times of unprecedented change and challenge. And the question I want to address today is what role might mediation, the skills of listening, of facilitation, dialogue and collaborative problem solving really have in this brave new world? Now, if I look back, I joined the Chartered Institute in 20, 2004, actually, which is over 15 years ago, and I was running the uh, mediation training course with David Richbell, um, a colleague many of you will know. And 15 years ago, the things that you see on the slide didn't even exist. All of this technology that's enabling us to even communicate today. So that makes me wonder, what about the future? What about our future and what about the future of mediation? Uh, now, many of you know, I have a granddaughter. She's a little bit uh, bigger than this now, but this is one of the pictures I really like of her just learning to smile. But it makes me think about the responsibility that we all have for our, not only our future, but our children's future and then future generations. And I wonder really what the world is going to look like, um, not only post COVID uh, or after the US elections, but what it's going to look like in 2030, for example, what, what future are we creating? And the question I really want to ask is what type of world do we want to create? And what if it was up to us to shape it? Because there are really, really big conversations that we all need to have now. There are conversations which are happening right now about uh, race, about climate change, about terrorism um, and pollution and so on. And I believe that there is no better time than now and no, no more relevant time for us to be considering the role that mediation could have in helping us to understand and create these dialogues, these effective com conversations that we really need to have. So um, a colleague of mine, and many of you will know, Michael Leeds used to be the uh, general counsel of BAT, British American Tobacco. And Michael Leeds was a great advocate in the early years of alternative dispute resolution. So much so that, um, in British American Tobacco, which had a lot of um, intellectual property litigation in those days and probably still does. Michael instituted within British American Tobacco um, an early dispute resolution system. He was a real advocate of um, early dispute resolution. Now, Michael in 2010 wrote a paper uh, which was called 2020 Vision, looking into the future to see what he thought, where he thought mediation would be. Um, and so, in, 20, in 2020 vision, here, here are some of the things that Michael thought uh, would be happening in the future. Do you have a next slide? And then the next slide, that's it, thank you. Um, so it, Michael had a look back and he found that the um, CPR Institute was founded in 1979. In 1981, getting to yes, this is the foundational book of the principle versus positional bargaining uh, negotiation was published. In 1983, the Harvard Project on Negotiation was instigated. And only in 1990 was CEDA, the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution, where I used to work, founded. So um, uh, the history of mediation in, in terms of using it in legal disputes is really fairly new and this new field really inspired many new practitioners to define uh, what education in this field would look like and to define the skills and processes that many of us use today. So then Michael went on and looked at what 
predictions might he have for the future? Where might mediation be in the next 10 years? And he concluded that really it needs to be now viewed as something which is not an alternative form of dispute resolution, but is in fact the primary form of dispute resolution. But actually, as Michael Lees found in the commercial arena, good conflict management will be considered part of good corporate governance in every company and that companies will actually design their own systems for evaluating, managing and resolving disputes, just as Michael has done. Back in 1995, I took part under the guidance of um, Professor Charles Handy, some of you may remember him, in the Tomorrow's Company Inquiry. And, and that was one of the things that really inspired me into mediation. It inspired me to take the step to uh, seeing how we could change the culture and the way that we manage disputes in organisations. And uh, the question they asked in, in the Tomorrow's Company Inquiry is, what is a company for? And a number of findings came out of that. But one of the key findings was this, the adversarial approach to relationships, so not even conflict or disputes per se, but the adversarial approach to relationships in organisations is one of the key things that holds businesses back from achieving at their potential. And just that finding spurred me on to say, as a, as a competitive lawyer, what would I do? What might I do to change this culture in organisations? Another person who's been really uh, inspirational in my journey as a mediator has been P.D. Villareal. He used to be the general legal counsel at GE in the States. And I spoke again to P.D., in fact, recorded a podcast with him just a couple of weeks ago. And again, in British America, in GE, um, P.D. had instigated this early dispute resolution system, not only in his litigation department, but cascading throughout the whole department and the whole organization so that everybody would know what alternative dispute resolution was and how they might use it. So I want to think about what are the current challenges? Where do we go beyond mediation? How might these skills of mediation, negotiation be extending beyond dispute resolution? And might we build negotiation, mediation, collaboration skills routinely into every type of core education? Could we teach it in schools? Can we teach it in nursery schools? Can we teach it in our law schools, in our universities? Should it be part of core education, not just something somebody who wants to qualify as a mediator? So what about opportunities for the future? Well, um, my colleague and, and one of our legal colleagues, uh, Lord Newberger, was on the Today programme just a few weeks ago. And he was talking about how they expect there to be an avalanche of disputes following um, this COVID crisis. And I think speaking to my clients, I agree with him. There are many tensions building up in workplaces about people going back to work, about rental um, property, um, about staff issues. There are going to be partnership issues. There are going to be so many conflicts that people have been sitting on in the last few weeks that are really going to come to bear. And one of the things that Lord Newberger said was that um, he encouraged people to think about using mediation to resolve some of these conflicts. So, as Catherine mentioned, we at the Chartered Institute have instigated this new scheme. Um, it, it's a, a joint scheme, a collaborative scheme with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and CEDA. And it's to encourage businesses to, who may have COVID related conflicts to access a online dispute resolution system at a fixed cost. And there's much more information on this scheme available on the website. The other thing which has really um, come to force in the last few weeks is online virtual mediation. We've all known that it was an opportunity, but now we've really had to use it. And I myself have been involved in one online mediation. It was with a French client. I would otherwise have been on the Eurostar traveling to Paris. Now I sat in my office. I had a translator helping me. And to me, it was a wonderful experience. I was able to really engage with the clients online. And more importantly, with the clients, I was able to actually help design the process. We were able to have a completely different process than we might have had if we'd set aside just one day. We were able to take the time to go a little bit more slowly with the mediation and take it over several sessions. And therefore I built up a real relationship with the clients and we reached a really good outcome. 
And the final thing is we're doing today that um, the opportunity that we have in the future is really to now have online training and events. Yesterday, I spoke at an event in Russia. I spoke at another event earlier in the day. So we, you know, we can really reach out to so many people with online training events. And um, we are launching a, an online mediation training uh, program here at the Chartered Institute starting in September this year, which will really be international, be able to reach out to people all around the world and enable them to develop their mediation training skills. So that's really exciting. Um, but what about beyond mediation? What are some of the skills, I wonder, that we as mediators, um, we as mediators use and that perhaps businesses could actually also use the skills of designing and facilitating, the skills of defining what outcome you want, very especially the skill of curiosity and storytelling. You know, this is something which is really important in a mediation, but being able to enable people to be curious and tell their stories. What about emotional and social intelligence? And this idea that we resolve complex problems, which all businesses have to do. Then creativity, intuition and visionary thinking. And finally, something that all of us really need today, which is resilience and perseverance. So all of these are skills that we as mediators need, but perhaps we could be uh, teaching these, perhaps we could be helping businesses to build these into their experience. So then I want to think about what I call the next revolution. Um, where have we come from? If you really think back in history, um, we have, we've had a number of revolutions, haven't we? We had the physical revolution, which you might define as the Big Bang. We had the biological revolution, which is evolution itself. Then we had the agricultural revolution and then the industrial revolution. And now we might say that we're in the IT or the technology uh, revolution. And right back at the beginning of time, the space between those revolutions was billions or millions of years. I mean, huge amounts of time, but now time seems to be going so quickly and the space is um, narrowed right down to decades uh, and even less. And where I think, what do I think we're missing? You know, we, we've reached this stage where we've got technology to help us to do what we're doing today, um, but maybe we're missing something, which is the ability to increase our understanding in each other, in human beings, in behaviour. And really, this is quite a recent phenomenon, the idea that we understand these things about ourselves. If you look back to the 18th century, the human brain was a bit like a black box. We knew that it was there. We, we didn't quite know how it worked, but we had no idea how emotions and how behaviour worked. What, what were the inner workings of this brain? And, and what was this idea about electrochemical hormones and so on? It, all of this was a mystery. And now we can know that um, human behavior and how we operate reflect many factors. They reflect things that have happened to us. They reflect facts and data, things that we can actually measure, but they also reflect sensations, emotions and thoughts. So one of the things that I've taught a lot in advanced mediation training is this idea that there are three levels of development for mediators. As mediators, or as any professional really, uh, when you learn a skill, when you go into training, you, you learn the very basic skills. So as mediators, we learn how to listen, how to question, how to manage the process of a meeting, how to manage emotions. We learn all those procedural things. The next step then is we learn to develop those skills in context. We actually go into a live mediation. We begin to practice on people and in situations. But the final level, I think, of development for any professional, and particularly for us as mediators, is this awareness of our own personal qualities, an awareness of ourself, and an awareness of the impact that we as individuals can have, for better or even for worse, on the mediation process, on the parties, on the whole process. And so, that has made me think, and one of the things I say I've been very interested in is developing um, mediation training and thinking, where do we go? Is mediation perhaps now 
uh, does it have a multidisciplinary approach? Are there some things from outside that pure mediation training that we can learn, that we can bolt on um, to help us to be better mediators, to help us to be better people? And can some of that training be offered to those outside mediation, to lawyers and businesses? So as I mentioned, every year I've been really fortunate to go and deliver the um, to the Association of Northern Mediators up in Malham. We've run a retreat which has been an advanced mediation skills retreat. And um, I have been able to bring to bear some of the advanced thinking around some of these emotional things. Let me first tell you where some of my thinking comes. About 20 years ago, I was in my local library um, just browsing and a heavy book fell off the top shelf and hit me on the head. Um, it was called, and this is a paperback version of it, um, but it was called Love, Medicine and Miracles. Now that's uh, a book by a doctor, Dr. Bernie Siegel, and Dr. Bernie Siegel wrote at that time, I think it was 1979 he wrote the book, a, quite a revolutionary idea. The idea that as a doctor, instead of putting his patients in boxes uh, which related to their symptoms, he would treat the whole person and he would see what else was going on in their life and what else was impacting them. And in fact, he said, if we move away from this idea of fear as being something that uh, impacts on us and put love at the heart of all our relationships, perhaps that could make a difference. Now, I was really inspired by Bernie Siegel. You know, when we look in the UK at what profession do we want our children to go into, it's usually either is it law or, or medicine. We put those two professions on a pedestal. And the idea that with those professions, which are very fact and database, that you could move away from this idea of being competitive, being fact and database, to put love, by which I mean respect for human beings, understanding of human beings, the ability to listen. Could we put those things at the heart of our practice? So this is some of the things that I've um, begun to look at in terms of mediation practice. Uh, one of my colleagues, and, and, and for many of you, is Ken Cloak. Uh, he's a US mediator. He's a very prolific author. And again, I've interviewed him on one of my podcasts, has written a fantastic paper called Bringing Oxytocin into the Room. Now, many of you know oxytocin is called the love hormone, but it, it, Ken has written a very academic paper exploring how actually being aware of some of these factors can impact on how our brain works and impact on how we may be thinking in a mediation, in a negotiation, in a meeting. So it's really revolutionary to be able to think about those kind of things. Um, moving on to my time up in Malham, we um, I've been very fortunate to have some guest speakers. One of the guest speakers who came to work with us is a friend and colleague of mine called Mark Delissa. Now, Mark is a gospel singer. He's very famous for working with Gareth Malone on The Voice. He also runs his own um, series on TV. And Mark came with us up to Malham and we ran a session called The Power of Participation and the Value of Voice. Basically, we get a lot of people who think they can't sing to sing. And um, the purpose of this was that in a mediation or in any business meeting, you often have people who are reluctant to participate. They can't find the power of their voice. They don't know when to speak and when to remain silent. They're shy or they hold back, or perhaps they use their voice too much. So in this workshop, we were able to, even if you thought you couldn't sing, explore the idea that perhaps there was some value in understanding how people who felt afraid of singing in public, using their voice, how they felt. So we got so much out of this workshop and actually many of the people who were in it said it was one of the best things they had ever experienced, but they couldn't quite explain what it was they'd learnt. The other thing, um, one of the other workshops I ran, this was at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Symposium a few years ago, was a workshop called What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. Now, the first thing that happened to all the participants when they came into the room is there were no seats. That upset many of them, so it took them already outside of their comfort zone. The second thing I asked them to do, which was using some of the skills from improvisational theatre, was to simply walk around the room and say to hello to each other, as if they had a, a lemon, a bitter lemon in their mouth, 
or B, as if their pants were on fire. So can you imagine senior lawyers walking around the room saying hello to each other as if they had a bitter lemon in their mouth or as if their pants were on fire? And again, this was A, to take people out of their comfort zone, but also to just explore how we might understand some of these things about ourselves and bring them into the mediation process. Another uh, legal colleague of mine, um, some of you may have heard of, Jerry Spence, he wrote a book called um, how to, how to argue and win every time. And Jerry Spence was the lawyer, the trial lawyer in the States who uh, represented Karen Silkwood in the Karen Silkwood trial. He claims to have never lost a trial, but uh, Jerry Spence every year runs again, like I do, a retreat for trial lawyers. Now the trial lawyers who sign up on Jerry Spence's um, course thought they were going to learn about cross-examination. They thought they were going to learn really serious things about how do we manage ourselves in the court. But what Jerry Spence did is he took them to his barn and he got them walking, he got them writing poetry, he got them singing, he got them dancing, very similar to the things that I do up in Malham. And Jerry Spence really said to his delegates, you know, if I don't know myself, how can I know you? If I can't be real about myself and be vulnerable, how can I allow you to be vulnerable with me? If I haven't been where you've been, if I haven't struggled as you've struggled, how can I empathize with your struggles? So I guess we all as mediators, as professionals and as human beings need to understand the value of being able to be vulnerable and to show our human side from time to time. And that's one of the things I think we need to learn about ourselves and learn to teach as well. So where does that bring us to in terms of um, what comes next? What's the future? What's the future beyond the technological revolution? Oh, there we are. There's me clowning and humour <laughs> with my red nose, which I love. Um, so beyond the technical revolution, where do we get to? what comes next? Well, I think we are heading towards, or hopefully are heading towards, perhaps another revolution. And that revolution is a revolution of us in consciousness, in awareness, an ability to balance the facts and data that we all work with in business and in profession with this awareness of ourselves as humans and this awareness of others and some of the factors that are so vital in mediation. One of the factors that's really vital in mediation is the idea of storytelling and nothing could be more important than the stories we tell ourselves about the society we're in, about what's happening, about some of the challenges that we face. And this is where the real power I believe is in the ability to tell stories. And so the big question, I think, is how are we going to use these skills, our skills, the knowledge of mediation to help people in crisis, to help people in this national time of crisis, to have these big conversations that we all need to have. We've got to bring these human attributes of connection, of values, of story and build a culture. And so one of the other exercises that I've loved to do up in Malham is an exercise called defining moments where the participants tell their story or in fact what we've done is to explore and perhaps you'd like to think about this now what is your why what is the why that attracts you to mediation to alternative dispute resolution what is it about you about things that have happened to you in the past that have meant that mediation has sparked an interest for you, that it means something to you. And the idea of carrying these skills forward into, into the community, into the business place, actually are something that's very exciting. So certainly, Malin, we did this exercise, everybody talked about, and again, was very vulnerable in sharing some of their defining moments, the moments that made them who they are. And this phrase, Ubuntu, came up very spontaneously from all the delegates because they said, and I think this is really important now in this time of racial tension. I am what I am because of what we all are, or I am what I am because of who you are. In other words, we are all one. We are all we because of you, and I am me because of you. We need to understand that we are all connected. We're all connected at a very deep level, and we're not separate and we don't need to be in competition. So I just want to imagine if we did have this shift from this 
culture of competition to the culture of collaborative, um, the ability to collaborate, what difference that would make in politics and in business and indeed in, in law and in mediation. So just a final quote, um, President John F. Kennedy said, we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, but the new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises, it is a set of challenges. And um, I know when I started out in mediation back in the early 1990s, it was seen definitely as something very alternative, something to be very skeptical about. And I go back to this idea that a new idea is always at first condemned as ridiculous, then it's seen as trivial, and only finally does it become accepted as something that everybody knows. I hope we're reaching that stage now with mediation that it becomes accepted as something that everybody knows. And so I'd like to go back to start where I began. Um, I hope you're not sitting comfortably. I hope you feel inspired to go forward, to take up the challenge, to educate yourselves and to educate, let's educate each other, to be able to take the challenge to develop our skills and to guide and educate each other in the skills of mediation so that we can decide what future we want and help to shape that future for ourselves and future generations. Thank you very much. Jane, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation on mediation skills and the future of a mediation. I really enjoyed listening to what you had to say, and I'm sure our audience did too. I think it's fair to say that what mediation involves, that whilst it involves many specialist skills, it also draws a lot upon what it means to be human. Empathy, listening, communication and storytelling. These are the things that resonate with all of us, and I'm sure this is one of the reasons why mediation is such, a, such an appealing form of ADR because it talks to us as humans. But as you have rightly alluded to in your presentation, the being part of what it means to be human, the existence existing within different frames of, of reference, whether they be social, political, economic, or social, or cultural, of course mean that as times change, the way in which we exist and the way in which we live together naturally change as well. And this evolution, or what you called revolution in your presentation, also raises questions as to mediation and what, what skills mediators will require in the future as times around us and circumstances around us change. 
Technology, as you have identified, is a major influence here. Technology has, of course, changed how we communicate with each other. Face-to-face -face communication has now been supplemented by virtual forms of communication. And you and I talk quite regularly and have spoken many times about what effect the absence of the body and indeed presence in general will have on the way in which we as people interact and communicate with each other. And this too in the future is likely to have a, a bearing on mediation skills, particularly if mediations are done virtually. With that in mind, I'll, I'd like to start by asking you a question. Given the rise of technology, one of your revolutions, what effect do you think technology will have on interpersonal relations and how will a mediator have to manage those changes in the future? Thank you, Parish. Um, well, of course, in the last few weeks or months, we've all been getting used to the idea of Zoom calls and Zoom conferences. I was on about five yesterday. And uh, as I say, I was presenting in Russia in the afternoon, which was amazing. So I think it's opened up huge possibilities for us. But also we do have to be aware of what the um, what the restrictions are, what, what can we not do? And certainly in my mediation, I found it much more difficult to read body language. You know, usually I'd be, be very aware of um, the context and, and the body language of people. And of course, I was seeing them one by one on a screen rather than all sitting around a table. So I think we need to be aware of the limitations that technology places on us. And perhaps then to be thinking about how do I better build rapport on screen? How do I better prepare the parties? And this is one of the issues that came out of our conference in Russia yesterday was thinking about perhaps we could have, for example, um, a trial run on Zoom so that people have got used to the idea of seeing each other on screen, e even though they may be doing that in their business meetings. The idea of mediating on screen is perhaps quite alien to many people uh, and they feel nervous coming into a mediation anyway. So we've got to understand how uh, it's it's a bit like this power of participation, the value of voice. What what is it going to what restrictions are people going to find in using um, this technology and how can we help them to feel more comfortable and to find their voice more easily um, and understand what they're afraid of or what they're not sure about? Sure. I think the we mentioned about the voice is obviously very important because in the absence of physical body it, it, without um, having that person not present, then a lot, there's a lot more emphasis upon other things, such as the way in which you talk yeah. to each other and the way in which you communicate yeah. and the voice and everything else. So I think yeah. that's certainly very important. And um, yeah. we've, we've seen a rise of uh, virtual mediations, virtual arbitrations and other forms of virtual communication, naturally, especially during lockdown. And looking at some of our audience questions, a large number of them focus upon the relevance of mediation in, a, in resolving the disputes that will have arisen because of lockdown, certainly mm -hmm. lots of businesses right now, some of those issues that have arisen in supply chains and so forth. And you mentioned that CIRB has launched a scheme around that. But what, what role can mediation play um, as opposed to maybe arbitration and litigation and enabling people to resolve those disputes that have arisen because of lockdown? I think one of the biggest benefits of mediation is that it enables people who want their business relationship to continue to have the opportunity for that to happen um, because you're not going into such an adversarial process you're going into a process which looking at a resolution and the potential for you to heal that relationship or manage that relationship in a way that that could continue and i think that's going to be important for many businesses right now whether that's an employment issue a partnership issue or an issue with colleagues and clients, it's going to be really important for them to be able to, to uh, continue those business relationships. So that's one of the main benefits, apart from um, what I call the cost control cycle time. So the fact that you can reduce the cost, um, retain more control, and the cycle time of your conflict resolution is, is vastly reduced. I mean, some of those issues that have arisen because of lockdown are likely to be highly complex issues involving certainly large sums of money. Um, one of the questions that came in was from, from someone asking about construction claims, where yes. we do see lots lots of complexity, um, especially those large say, large sums, delays and other issues that affect um, complex construction um, projects. And there's often a perception that maybe mediation isn't the appropriate forum for those um, types of claim. And actually, the more arbitration or even construction adjudication might be a better their claims will be better served by those forms of ADR so to what extent do you think that mediation can 
help with those larger complex claims in which large sums of money are large sums of money are involved or reputational business relations as you mentioned well again in construction disputes and i've mediated many construction disputes um there is usually a need for the business relationship to continue beyond i mean you know that that's one of the key things about the construction industry is that it's it's made up of people who are in relationship ongoing relationships with each other with new projects to be happening uh, and certainly one of my mediations, I remember, which was a construction dispute, it ended up with the two parties sitting around a table in a wine bar discussing their next deal because we had reached a resolution in the mediation. So, uh, you know, I understand that the complexity of some of these disputes makes them uh, very difficult to resolve. But on the other hand, if you've got the right parties around the table and the willingness to resolve something, they should be able to, um, they should be able to use the mediation process well to reach that resolution. So uh, another question that came in, which is related to that, is the idea of equitable participation, equality of arms. I mean, um, sometimes in s some mediations, power differentials might arise between parties where one party has is perceived to have greater power or more sway over another party. And in those situations, one can imagine often there might be deadlock between the parties. Because they might be willing to give way. So how does a mediator handle those issues in which power interferes, the differences in arms appear. How is that, how is that handled? Well, my view, and it may be, <clears throat> yes, my, my view, and it may be different from other mediators, because we all have our different takes mm -hmm. on the way we mediate, but m my way is to be very um, facilitative and, and enable the parties to make their own decisions. So in other words, um, I feel my job is to help people get clear, clarify what the issues are, um, be very clear what the options are and what the risks are. So we do a, a whole risk analysis and to make a very then to make a very clear decision based on that. So if part of the mm -hmm. risk analysis is to understand that they're under pressure because the other party has got more power, then they make their decision based on that. But I can't as a mediator equalize that power. I can help as you know, we talked about this again, the power of participation, the value of voice. It's important as a mediator to enable everybody to be heard and enable them all to listen to each other. So that's part of the process management, but you can't actually equalize the power between two parties. You can only equalize the opportunity to be very clear what the issues are and to make the right decision for them in all the circumstances. And of course, there are different types of mediation technique and we've discussed some of those before. It's not one size fits yeah. all. So would you like to just talk about some of those different mediation techniques, please? Yes, so Parish, uh, I think you're talking there. So there might be sort of several different layers of mediation technique. One would be called adjudicative valuation, um, evaluative mediation, which is where the mediator is probably um, an expert or has some uh, legal experience in the field of the dispute and is able to give the parties uh, and the lawyers uh, not only a steer, but perhaps uh, an opinion as to where this dispute might go if it was in the in, in the court process. So that's evaluative mediation and, and, and many lawyers and many parties feel comforted at having a mediator who will give that kind of steer to a case. Um, the next kind of um, a mediation, a style of mediation is what you'd call facilitative mediation and facilitative mediation is where the mediator is simply facilitating the process but enabling the parties to make their own decision, but following a very specific process, very much as the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators training um, outlines and the CEDA training would outline. Uh, there are many other types. One other type that I've trained in, which I, I, I like a lot, actually, I'm very drawn to is transformative mediation. And the idea, many people misunderstand transformative mediation because they think that in a psychological sense, I'm going to be transforming the parties um, and their mindset. But that's not the case. Transforming mediation uh, is simply being able to um, understand that where conflict arises is because the conversation itself has broken down. And instead of being an effective dialogue, it becomes uh, an ineffective and destructive dialogue. And so as transformative mediators, we focus very much on the dialogue and helping the people to the people involved to transform their dialogue to be more effective so that they themselves can make their own decisions. So it's based on this concept of what I call self-determination. 
um, which I'm very passionate about in organizations and in boardrooms, enabling people to make their own decisions um, based on the fact that they are empowered and have their own decision making power. And I mean, just to draw some of the themes so far together, of course, the world around us is changing. You've just spoken about some different types of mediation technique. And of course, it's a, it's, it's a work in progress. I mean, we're all learning. I'm sure you as a mediator, you, you look at other disciplines and other ways, other techniques and try to break new ground. So, I mean, so what sort of work do you do and what, what other work that you might not other mediators do in the field of discovering new forms of mediation, uh, mediation tools, mediation techniques? What research do you draw upon in order to break new ground in, in the field of mediation? I think... I just read very widely, Parish. I go on as many courses as I can. I'm very interested in, in the skills of leadership development. Um, so I'm very interested in that. As you know, I'm very interested in psychology and how the human brain works and, uh, and those kind of things. And as well, these creative skills like improvisational theatre and so on. I think there are so many strands that we can draw on. Um, and I've often said to mediators who come on my training course, you know, just find something that you're drawn to, that you're interested in, but that takes you outside your comfort zone and go learn about it. Because anything we do um, that takes us into a new field um, that we can add on to our skills as mediator is going to help us develop. So I think for us, there's a huge opportunity to add some of these skills into our training. And I certainly, as you see, try to add them into the trainings that I deliver. Absolutely. Um, I mean, so to what extent can mediation draw from other forms of ADR, for example, arbitration um, and negotiation, conciliation, adjudication? To what extent can it be informed by other forms of ADR in, in sort of way in which it's, it's practiced? Are there other things you can take from those other disciplines? Certainly from negotiation. I mean, obviously, there's a negotiation phase in mediation. So at, at, at one yeah. stage, the parties start to negotiate and we do teach negotiation. We need to understand how negotiation works and how the psychology of negotiation influencing works. So that's yeah. another area which is interesting to study. I think with um, the other um, forms of alternative dispute resolution, it's very important to understand those because sometimes um, and, and much more nowadays, people uh, would like to adopt a blended approach or if not a blended so they might have something what we call medarb so they might mediate and then arbitrate if it doesn't resolve or they might actually as i was talking about in my presentation if they've got it built into their organization there might be a um an escalation sort of clause or or or, or provision which says you know we what we will do is we'll uh, negotiate face to face if that doesn't work we'll mediate so we need to understand how those um how those processes feed into each other and when it might be appropriate to adopt one and when another one might be more appropriate for the client. And you mentioned um, that maybe mediation is a technique that can be sort of taken out to universities and it can be integrated within different disciplines of, I guess, medicine, science, mediation mm -hmm. exists in law already, construction. Um, so what can what, what should universities be thinking about when it comes to dispute resolution and it's, it's, there are different forms of adr not just mediation i suppose but other forms of adr as well how can the curriculum how can curricula be informed by adr and adr techniques at, at I people are learning about but you know there's so many topics that where people could be introduced to mediation and you know, not only that, you know, Catherine mentioned my writing, but I've always written about the interface between interpersonal disputes and business disputes. And I think, you know, if you go into me, if you go into universities and schools, what people are most concerned about is how do I resolve the conflict with my parents or how do I resolve the conflict with my teenage pals? And that's a really good place to start because it's introducing the concept of mediation to them in a place that really matters to them. Uh, you know, perhaps they can learn negotiation skills in terms of how are they going to negotiate in a job interview and that kind of thing. So there are a lot of areas where we can introduce it in the playground, if you like, uh, and at a lower level, uh, where people can begin to learn about it in the context that really matters to them at that stage. I'm delighted to be joined by a, a very diverse and international audience today. And, and a, a question I'd like to ask you is what international trends do you do you see in mediation going forward? I mean, certainly um, the pandemic has seen has seen the backlog in courts. So there'll be a, a greater demand for, for mediation um, around the world. So what are the trends that you're seeing currently in the field of mediation? 
Well, it was interesting being in the conference in Russia yesterday because we were talking about this a little bit and just sharing our experiences. And I think around the world, we're all at different stages in terms of mediation development. You know, at the Chartered Institute, we are very interested in working in some of the African countries, um, which are, are, are have been uh, taking up mediation at a later stage. So, you know, when we go back to looking at uh, that chart I put up, you know, mediation in, in the context it's in now in legal disputes really started in the United States. So then it's spread out through um, the UK and Europe and then around the world. So we're all at different stages and different phases, but actually everybody else is, is catching up fast. So I think we need to be aware of how we can all help each other and to understand different styles and how those styles can interact with the different cultural preferences in those countries. I think some of those things are really important to understand, you know, what what are the cultural preferences? What are the, some of the ways in which the culture impacts on mediation or mediation impacts on how the culture uh, and integrate that into the training that we're offering? So, I mean, uh, uh, related questions, how do we promote inclusivity and uh, sort of diversity in mediation, I, I guess, to enable more people to enter the, the profession or, or the discipline. Um, I mean, certainly somebody might be trained and then they'll be looking for their first mediation appointment um, and networking might be important and other things might be important to, to, to kind of gain, gain that first mediation appointment. So what, what, would you, what advice would you give to, to young mediators who want to enter the profession following their training? Uh, well, the advice I was given when I first trained as mediator was don't give up the day job. And that's still the advice is that uh, it, it takes a long time to build a mediation profession. So that's the first piece of advice, don't give up the day job. But I think you're right, Parish. it's about building a network. And I hope at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators that we, and particularly given now that we are able to run these magnificent events online, uh, we can encourage wider networking and wider integration of all the branches and all the different cultures so that people can um, feel that this is a more inclusive profession that they can enter and that they can connect with people who've got more experience than, you know, I'm always happy to uh, speak to a mentor and, and take younger mediators into my mediations with me where I can. So I think those of us that are more senior in the profession have got to be open to um, mentoring some of the younger members. I think that's the answer. Uh, and do you see technology as a disruptor or an enabler there? Because on the one hand, technology can come in and disrupt. We hear about uh, robot mediators, for example, and the idea that <laughs> a piece of technology or, or, or an algorithm or artificial intelligence can basically help yeah. Yeah. mediate between parties. So from that, you know, from that extent, it could be a disruptor, but it can also be an enabler, allowing people to come in, um, sort of these startups and, and other people who, and other individuals who, who may have bright ideas and, and say, well, that's the mediation and ADR space is something that we can enter through our through our work in technology. So for you, is 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 technology a leveler? Can it enable and facilitate mediation for the better? I think so, uh, and I think so for various reasons. I mean, I've recently uh, had a number of inquiries during this um, lockdown crisis from people who are quite local to me with quite small scale disputes that normally I wouldn't have been able to help with. But when you think, could I offer half an hour online could I offer one hour online instead of a full piece, one day mediation? Well, perhaps I could offer some of that service. So perhaps we can be a bit more diverse in our offerings and the way and the kinds of people that we can offer help to. And I think so. I think it, that it, it's very enabling. And as I said, also with the uh, with the mediations that I've done, you know, being able to uh, plan uh, the process and design the process to suit the parties. I think it offers us huge opportunities. So you mentioned Michael in your presentation and he looked 10 years into the future from 2010 to 2020. And I'm sure you knew this question was coming, Jane. If, <laughs> where, where do you see mediation in 20, 30, 10 years down the line? 2030, gosh. Um, I honestly hope and believe that it will be. I mean, it, it, it's taken. We've always been excited about mediation. I thought it was about to. It, it was about. To, it was about to be it, its time. I, I genuinely think it is the time for mediation. Now, I do think it's a skill for the twenty first century. So I think in twenty thirty. I really do believe it will just be something that's absolutely mainstream, that we will have incorporated it into our schools, into our businesses, into the way we think and the way um, we believe. I, I think there's such a there's such a movement behind it now. And there are so many people, as I say, with this 
a passion for it um that i do believe if we all if we all do our piece that we can we can make mediation a part of the way we do business and the way we live and in the next 10 years i mean you mentioned that the judges right now are talking about the backlog and, and, and promoting ADR and forms of mediation arbitration. Do you see in the next 10 years more government, more states around the world, governments and, and judiciaries promoting the use of ADR increasingly because of issues with backlogs and, and, and other and other potential influences? I mean, do you see a, I mean, do you see states promoting ADR more? in the next 10 years? I, I think so. It's not my area of work, but you know, um, one of our colleagues, Bill Marsh, many people who are listening to today will know that Bill has travelled all around the world and has worked with many governments and very successfully. So there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes with many governments and indeed in the UK with many government departments who are actually very interested in and who are embracing ADR. So I think that at that you know, at that level, at that national level, there really is a movement to understand and incorporate ADR into their thinking as well. And certainly the Singapore Convention, I see the, the major having a major impact on that as well. Uh, so yeah. Jane, I mean, in, in December of this year, we, we are having a symposium, mediation symposium, something that you're heavily involved in, in with me, um, on multidisciplinary uh, mediation the extent to which mediation can draw from other disciplines such as psychology, anthropology, science, technology, law, and so forth. Um, so do you have a, a particular discipline that you think, uh, what, what discipline apart from mediation are you drawn to in developing your, your mediation practice, whether it be anthropology, psychology, sociology, could you tell us what discipline interests you the most? Apart from just I think mediation. it's more psychology, understanding the human being and the human mind. I am fascinated by that. Uh, and, you know, the more I've uh, delved into it, and, and, you know, I've only scratched the surface, to be honest. There's so much to learn. And I, I think that's what excites me about mediation. You know, I, I've only just begun, really, to discover all there is to discover. So uh, there's no possibility of me retiring anytime soon. There's, uh, we're only at the beginning. But I think that there's such a huge wealth to understand about how and why we operate as human beings and how we can... I do that better. And as an educator, it would be remiss of me not to ask you, Jane. Um, so five skills. What, are, what do you think are the five core skills of a mediator? Well, obviously listening, I think. Um, questioning to a degree. I mean, we do need to ask questions. But again, in transformative mediation, we downgrade the uh, power of questioning a little bit more. Um, where have we got to? I think, you know, understanding storytelling, I think creative problem solving. But I think, again, I go back to my thing. I think this final skill is the power to understand ourselves. Who am I as a mediator? Um, who am I in the context of this meeting? What do I bring to it? What is my specific skill? And um, one of the things I did an exercise was to go back through the feedback I'd had from my clients because I didn't know. I didn't know why was I, why was I chosen? What did they like about me? I didn't know. So sometimes going back through the feedback and saying, why was I chosen and what do people appreciate about me specifically can give you some good feedback. Well, thank you, Jane, for answering those questions and for giving us your views on how mediation is likely to change for the future. Some fascinating themes came out of the question and answer session there. I mean, looking at power differentials, the skills that mediators will require in the future, and looking at the trends in mediation, especially at yeah, 2030. I mean, um, it'll be interesting to see what the next 10 years brings. I mean, this time last year, who would have thought a pandemic would be upon us? And, and suddenly mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing how time can change. And I'm sure I, I enjoyed listening to you, and I'm sure our audience did. So thank you very much for that. Um, at this point, I, I'd I'd just like to return to a point I made at the beginning of this question and answer session, looking at humanness and mediation, and you've mentioned communication, listening, empathy, which are obviously important skills of a mediator. And as times change, skills will change. And of course, we're, we're, you and I are working on virtual mediation training, and we're also working on the mediation symposium, information which can be found on the CIR website. And it's been a pleasure working with you on those uh, different initiatives. So thank you very much for your time there as well. Um, so all that remains to be said is on behalf of CIR and also of our global audience, thank you very much for giving us your time today and your experience. Um, it's been a delight talking to you and I look forward to um, talking to you and working with you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.